I was watching one of your uh, your IG stories. Okay. Hey, beautiful people. Yes. That's not bad, right? No. I'm trying to. Awesome. I'm man. trying Good to bring job, it. Bro. Trying to bring it like M Rob. <laughs> Mike, yeah, I'm with you. It's NFL Explained. It is a brand new edition of the show. You know the feedback that we've been getting on our mailbag episode, which is our last one, has been been pretty good yeah. pretty positive it's been right? positive good. so my dms have been I, I keep getting more and more questions they jump and that's what yeah. the young people say your dms are jumping and i had someone <laughs> and this is my bad for anyone who sent me a message and i was like hey we're gonna work it in and we didn't work it in because someone hit me up and was like yo i didn't hear my question and i was like <laughs> all right my bad so we got so many of them that we're actually going and i promise we're gonna get to all the questions so if you did submit one to me and i responded because i do respond to everyone trust me we'll get to those but what we're trying to do is actually take Take some of the questions that warrant like a ton of attention yes. and give them a full episode, which is exactly what this episode is all about. A deep dive into equipment in the NFL. And for me, I'm Rob, we had, you had, I shouldn't say we, like <laughs> you had the benefit of having a lot of modern technology, but anything that comes to mind that either you wish you did have or dudes when you were playing that were older said, man, you like back in my day, we had to walk, you know, 50 <laughs> miles in the snow to school, but like one of those types of moments, anything resonate? Um, I guess everybody remembers, you know, Brian Cox, the big neck roll oh, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. I played fullback, right? And so I used to get a lot of stingers in my day. And so, yeah, neck roll. I had the little little nub. It's like a little nub that kind of goes over your name plate. It doesn't go outside of your jersey. So I didn't I didn't look like a super big guy, yeah. but I still looked strong and dominant. You still wanted the look of a fullback. And I wish I, I, wish I could have worn the Vices helmet. It's one of the sa safest helmets on the market right now. It's expensive, yeah. but just the technology of the glancing blow. I mean, I had an air helmet, and a lot of our football enthusiasts know exactly <laughs> what that is. The, the, the only thing it had was you just had a couple of holes, one at the top, one in the back, and you just had to pump air in it when you needed some air, and you, you went on about your business. Do you like the – because I've – talked to a uh, couple guys that played well before you too and they would tell me that the shift in helmets actually was something that they felt was in some ways more safe in other ways like not as comfortable either which surprised me because some of these dudes were like the throwback like you know the really really thick padding on the inside <laughs> can helmets. i tell you a secret yeah what do you got all right look man all right this is between me and you okay Mike. okay Don't just tell just in no one one no one all right so I think it was 2002, 2003, or maybe 2004. I was at Penn State. Um, we all had the air helmets. It was nice and cool. Um, I got knocked out. You went out. to Penn State? I went to Penn State. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> um, I got knocked out. Uh, we were playing the uh, Wisconsin Badgers, Rasmus James, unblocked, first round pick. Hit me, boom. Knocked out, right? I was out for a few weeks. Okay. And I remember Coach Paterno um, saying, Hey, Robinson, you want to ride most explosive players? But you can't wear that air helmet anymore. And I'm like, Joe, what the hell you mean I can't wear my air helmet? This is all I've known. I've worn an air helmet since I was probably 11 years old. Not the same one, but yeah. I've worn that brand of a helmet. He And he, he made a mandate for me to go back in the game. I had to wear the newer at that time. It was a short helmet. It was big. It looked like it had an extra plate on top. And I had the biggest helmet in all of college football. I mean, literally, I was the laughing stock. It, it, I just looked like a bobblehead. But that was the only way I could. And, and, and Yams, I have a big head. <laughs> I can say that because I do have a big head, right? And so my helmet was already large, extra large if I had smaller pads. I mean, if I had big pads, large if I had smaller pads. And now I had this extra this extra piece uh, on my helmet. And uh, yeah, I was the laughing stock in my locker room for, for a little bit. But um, I was safe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, bobblehead at quarterback. <laughs> Got it done though. Just, I, I'm, I'm envisioning like the the shaking little bobblehead running around. Dude, the it was so field. big. Yeah. I hated yeah. it, but it did protect me. I can't lie. It was lighter. It felt better, and it took me a while to get used to it. But um, yeah. It All helped. right. So I think this is probably a pretty good place to start because mm -hmm. I think when you talk about NFL football, one of the first things in equipment, one of the first things you think about is certainly the helmet. So that's probably the best place to start for us because it has definitely changed and evolved throughout the years. And a lot of that has to do with what Emrod was just talking about, which is player health and safety. But we got to go all the way back, all the way back okay. to the beginning, 1917. 17? Yeah, 1-7. 1-7. Yeah, so this, that's, that's a ways to go. <laughs> the that is, world was different. 
now. We're all <laughs> a lot years ago. Yeah, very different. <laughs> University of Illinois head coach Bob Zupke. He designed the first leather helmet that the NFL used when the league first started a couple of years later in 1920. Really very protective uh, it, it, leather man, helmet. Leather helmets. Joe Paterno used to tell me after his high school games, they used to fold up their helmet and put it in their <laughs> back pocket. I'm like, Joe, you so old, man. I'm sorry I had to say that. <laughs> Can you imagine knowing someone who like actually went and did that? Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I mean, I can't. I mean, he used to tell a story about um, – Vince Lombardi playing against them in high school, and they used to fold up their helmet and put, like, dude, the stories were crazy, especially when he had some Jim like, Bean with him. You Ma- know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the Mount Rushmore, you start thinking about those dude with the, yes. the leather helmet, the Mount Rushmore of some of these players. Um, 1930s actually brought the first iterations of the face mask and plastic helmets, although those face masks, not face masks, weren't actually all that popular. 1943, the NFL mandated the use of helmets. Rams running back, Fred Gerke, he would subsequently give the NFL its first logo when he painted horns on his own helmet for a game in 1947. (laughs) By the way, can you imagine a dude right now, like, we're getting into, like, uniform rules? Like, you can't do stuff like that. You can't do anything, man. Are you kidding me? Man, hell with this. I don't got nothing on my helmet. Let me just paint something on the side of it. Paint some horns on the, the, like, (laughs) which is kind of cool. By the way, really cool side hustle for uh, Gerke. He ended up painting 75 Rams helmets. He was paid a dollar each. He made $75 for all that work. Yeah. Couldn't have worked today. That would have been a cheap. So, 1947, I feel like 75, 75 bucks would have gone like it a pretty- gone long. Yeah. yeah. My grandfather used to tell me stories about like, you know, in the 40s, like what's mm-hmm. the, like a, a buck for a helmet, man. Like that's not that bad. Don't nothing cost a dollar now. No, no, okay. no. Uh, nothing in the dollar store <laughs> yeah. still costs a dollar. 1950s, a single bar face mask invented by Cleveland's coach, Paul Brown, who had an equipment manager actually fashion one to a helmet in order to keep his quarterback Otto Graham in a game after he took a shot to the face. We'll hear more about what Paul Brown also did, really a savvy inventor, a little bit later here on this episode. But the single bar eventually became mostly a little bit of a fashion faux pas in yeah. the league. Not You you wouldn't be caught doing <laughs> no, one of those. No, you don't no. want just the one bar, man. No. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've seen some kickers get away with it, but you don't want the one bar. I'll vote with the one bar, Mike. Like, that would always, for me, feel like somebody could just punch you in your face, man. Like, it's, yeah. it just happened. It's yeah. right there. So, no. uh, last dude to actually go with the single deal, that? Joe Theismann. Isn't that crazy? By the way, we did a, a thing on NFL Network. It was like a football life. Uh-huh. And I guess the, he they changed the pronunciation. He recognizes it, but it used to be Theismann. Theismann. I, I don't remember that. I didn't even know that because I'm like, damn, why are they saying his name wrong? Because I caught it like halfway into the episode. I'm yeah. like, what is going on so right now? So, he told me that story at his restaurant one time. We had a, a schedule release show there that he made me pay for the dinner. I got to get at you, Joe. Wow. It's all good. Yeah. By the way- <laughs> Keep in mind, I mean, for, for Theismann, a quarterback to be doing that, kind of unique here, because oh, yeah. he was the last non-kicker uh, to wear the single bar across the face mask. 1962, though, all players wore face masks in the latter part of that decade. Crossbar actually adopted better protection around the face and the nose. By the 1970s, the full mask really began to catch on. And then we get to the 1990s. By the way, we talk about the 90s like it was a long time ago, like I feel like the 90s was a few years ago. But it was a long no. time ago, Mike. It, it was. Let's just which be is honest. Crazy. Uh, we, look, we got a little age on us, just a little bit. Yeah, a little tread on my tires, I'll tell you. <laughs> 90s come around. The helmet started to become more complex, little different pieces of the equipment. It weighed about three pounds and had more state-of-the-art padding. The newest helmet technology has added things like helmet inserts that are molded to each individual head so they better can absorb a lot of contact and then redirect some of that injury. Um you tell me, because I've actually, I mean, I've put it on for fun, but I've never worn one in the game, and the yeah. ones that I've thrown on are not specific for me. Comfortable, generally speaking? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you got to redefine what your definition of comfort yeah. is, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, you want it comfortable. Um, you want it so that it's not a lot of moving, a lot, not a lot of movement in, in the helmet. Um, I know for me, any time I put a new helmet on or, or a helmet on for the first time in a while, yeah, it's like you notice all the peripheral vision. Like you just notice all the, 
the things that's in your vision. Like yeah. if you have bars up, if you have bars kind of on the side, you know, you just notice this stuff. And for me, it does. It did take a little time just to kind of get yourself oriented in the helmet. I mean, again, it's like riding a bike. Once you've done it before, you you get used to it. But for me, I always needed to have the 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 top part or the eyes part of the the face mask unencumbered i didn't i couldn't have a lot of bars in front of it because i i always stood up at the fullback position so that i can see just like the runner can see so i can be his eyes and if sometimes if it was a bar right there it would trick me into thinking it was an actual person yeah and it would it would mess me it would mess me up in my spatial awareness How, how many helmets do you go through during the course of a season so it depends so um when I play quarterback, only one, you know, uh, when I play tailback, maybe two, um, fullback, especially my last year, we, when we won our Super Bowl, I went through five helmets, um, face mask breaking, just all the, all the, all the, the, the collisions, um, and then special teams that that's when kickoff was, we was really running down now kickoff. So yeah, I went through five helmets that last year. Wow. I still have them all. Too, do you, so, so do you like, <sighs> I mean, it's that's your helmet. Like, is that the one thing? Because we were talking about cleats, right? Yeah. On our mailbag episode last week, and like, do dude, some dudes like Russell Wilson, yo, wear it once, so that's it. It's that's a, it. It's a wrap for him. The helmet, like, I would imagine, because you're telling me, hey, when you're playing quarterback, it was one. Like you, it's like your piece of equipment. Oh Does yeah, it, it's, it's yours, man. And like, even when I, um, when I played for San Francisco, and then I went over to Seattle. You know, I brought my helmet with me. Yeah. You know, they repainted it. They re they redid it up because again, it, it is a personal thing. And um, a lot of times, especially the older helmets, they they, they would, you know, kind of like uh, they would kind of get worn, kind of and molded, kind of yeah. to your to, to your head. And you just get used to those types. So of you things. took them te- like I took them with me. I took my shoulder pads with me. Wow. Um, I- everything. Yeah. Like I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think Leonard Fournette still has his LSU shoulder pads. I mean, he no still kidding. wears purple shoulder. Guys are some of it's superstition, yeah. some of it's just being comfortable with the equipment, and some guys are just like, oh no, nah, man, I've won this many games in this, I ain't changing. And this is what it is. <laughs> uh, I had no idea about that. Uh, I did mention Paul Brown a little bit earlier uh-huh. about the helmets and the whole thing. Another huge contribution to helmet technology. Uh, not many people realize this, but you, oh, let's go back 1956. Brown was actually approached by two Cleveland fans who happened to be inventors and thought they could help the coach actually find a new way to communicate with his quarterback via radio signal. Here's how it goes. Okay. You got two dudes, John Campbell and George Solaris. They began testing the equipment in the woods near one of their homes, which what good <laughs> happens in the woods? Right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I've watched a whole lot of Dateline recently. Yeah. <laughs> After uh, it interfered the radio signal uh, with the police officer driving by, the cop was like, yo, what's going on? Actually questioned the two dudes. Like They really? found him and was like, yo, like, what's going on here? Here's the deal though. He, the, the cop was actually a Browns fan and said, oh, you know what? Yo, you keep rolling in the woods. You do whatever you want to do in the <laughs> woods. Crazy, so, right? and, and then here we go. So uh, Cleveland quarterback George Ratterman was the first to wear the radio helmet. Um, but the opponents at the time were the Lions. They got a little suspicious when they saw a transmitter on the sideline. Then NFL commissioner Burt Bell banned the new system, which didn't return until 1995 when the tr- the technology obviously Hold dramatically up. improved. Can what you, year was that? 70? What year was that? 56? 56, man. 56 when they started te- and then 95 yeah. was when they finally started using it. That. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Oh, that is crazy, man. What's and, the craziest part? That the fact that there was that much of a gap, or the cop was like, "Yo, you do whatever you want in the woods." Oh man, I already know, <laughs> man. Fans, you know what I'm saying? We're try with this tribalism here, man. I get it. Uh, but it, that long, I would have uh, just all the, the the great minds of the National Football League. You just would have thought that this idea would have came up a, a little bit faster. You, know you would I mean? think, but like, I also. It's a product of your environment. And there's no disrespect. We do a segment on total access. Yeah. No disrespect. And it <laughs> really is disrespectful, res- right? So I go, <laughs> here it is. No disrespect, but I wouldn't think Cleveland, the technology hub. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, dude, I was in the Bay Area for like almost a decade. So I yeah, think about Silicon Valley. But that's just because I know, of the, the way it's, you know, 
But in the fifties, right? Now, like, are man. you? Fi- I know. Well, that's the thing. I just still, that's me being young <laughs> yeah. on this episode. Okay, uh, that's crazy. But it man. is wild, and it took a really long time for the communication and the technology to improve. And this is what has made for some interesting developments on the football field now. In fact, there are rules around these communication systems. In fact, only two players on the field can, uh, can hear the sideline. That's the quarterback and the defensive captain, who's generally a linebacker. Those players are given the green dot sticker on their helmet to designate which helmet has the communication system in it. Only the sideline can talk to the players with the headset, no one from the booth. I actually didn't realize that. I thought you could get some of that communication from, and it would be wired that way, but that's not actually accurate. To me, that would be an unfair advantage. Because you could see the field. Yeah, you could see the yeah. field. The, the, the vantage point is a, is a little bit different. But, you know, it, it's crazy, right? Like, all this technology, to me, it's a gift and a curse. We all remember, uh, you know, Jared Goff, uh, Sean McVay, yeah. and the, the stories that, yeah, he would kind of feed them the plays and talk to them. And that's why they would run that hurry up offense, because with 15 seconds left on the play clock, that system cuts off and the quarterback can't talk to the sideline anymore. And so Sean McVay kind of figured out a loophole in it. You go hurry up offense, snap the ball before we get to 15 seconds. I can coach my quarterback through the entire play. And that and that, that's what was happening. I, I think, again, I think it's a gift and a curse, man, because at the end of the day, you want your quarterback to be able to see the information and be able to process the information and be able to come up and develop his own answers to the problem right there on the spot. Sometimes that that, that system can you can develop a crutch when you're just waiting on the play caller to feed you the information. Sometimes I think you can get a little bit muddy. So I'm actually glad you brought that up. And and just to be clear here, what M. Rob's talking about is the sideline actually cuts out with 15 seconds remaining on the play clock. And what you're describing to me is sort of what a lot of college quarterbacks deal with. Mm -hmm. Yo, this is what it is. You're not necessarily reading, right? It's well, you are. It's it's what's your first read, what's your second, third read, and so forth for a quarterback. Mm-hmm. As and it has less to do with what he's seeing on the football field from a defensive standpoint. Is that kind of where you're going with it? Yeah, and it's like okay, so let's say you know we're Sean McVay and Jared Goff, and you know we're early in the play clock. Quarterback comes to, comes to the line. The defense is trying to to, to disguise some things. Safety kind of walks down uh, to you know on the weak side of the offense. You know, quarterback doesn't know whether it's a blitz or not. The, the play caller can see it and say, oh, oh, check, check, check. Yeah. You know, check the weak side, you know, swing protection this way. I mean, that's an advantage to have your, your yeah. play caller basically thinking for you out there on the football field. Again, I think sometimes it can be a crush for quarterbacks when you need them to process the information. One other note that I did not realize until our – tremendous staff gave us the research and told us about this if i don't even know how often this actually happens and you could speak to this but if a team's communication system goes out the other team is not allowed to use theirs. yeah i've known i've known about that like i think it happened to me one time when i was in san francisco no maybe. kidding yeah like it went down and i remember at halftime um i think it was north turner at the time he was like guys north has a great mouth. Let's just say that he he the language he uses is amazing. Um, but I remember at halftime he was just getting at us like, guys, communication is terrible. Okay, I won't be able to talk to you. So, and I remember Alex. I remember looking over at Alex Smith, and he was like, damn man. And I was like, and me being a former quarterback, I was like, Alex, that means more running for you, right? Oh, yeah. And he's like, yeah, because you know now I got it quarterback has to run to the sideline yeah. get the play run all the way back and you get tired doing that man you get used to just kind of sitting out there hearing the play and then calling it and rob i i actually want to go back to something you said you you had mentioned the the comms going out with 15 seconds on mm-hmm. the play clock play clock when that happens is it chaotic on the field because you don't necessarily know is it hand signals like how do you transition the, in that the, moment? the few times that it has happened to me um uh, one time I had uh, um, a backup quarterback doing it, and yeah, it was chaos. Yeah. It was like, dude, guys, I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing the sideline, you know. And then, you know, calmer heads kind of, you know, happen. I think we had uh, Arnez Battle. He was one of our slot receivers. It was a third down, and he kind of had one of his favorite plays. He was able to kind of help the quarterback out. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody knows the game plan, and the quarterback should be prepared enough so that let's say it's a third down or let's say it's a second down and six or whatever. They know the game plans. They should know the yeah. game plan so well that the, it should be a, a play that they should have in the back of their mind to go to. You know, we did an episode on instant replay. Um, people always talk about it lengthening the game. Mm-hmm. The fact that things are more streamlined. Like we don't see teams huddle a whole lot, right? Like Mm -hmm. 
it, I almost feel like it's almost a good thing that there's a little bit more efficiency now in terms of the communication, the play calling, and what we're seeing in today's game. It's a great, it's, it's a great thing, actually, because, again, uh, again a, a quarterback can kind of be at the line of scrimmage. The, the, the whole offensive line can be at the line of scrimmage. Just think, guys, a, a play, uh, let me call a play, double wing right, quick ace right, 212F flat. I mean, in that entire play, the offensive line, all they need to hear is quick ace right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't care about everything else. In that, play, in that play, all the wide receivers need to hear is 212F flat. They don't need to hear the other part. You see what I'm saying? And so the fact that we're able to streamline the, streamline the communication, it helps everybody play a little bit faster. Was that your favorite play? It was one of them. Okay. Yeah. So it was like your slant go-to. Flat. Yeah, it was yeah. one of those slant flats. And it was actually – I was always – Cool, another cool, small, cool little story. I was always the emergency quarterback. Yeah, yeah. So I, on during walkthroughs on Saturdays, I would always take the walkthroughs and I would always, you know, call my plays and stuff like that. So I was pretty dope with that. That was a three step game. And then on game day, I always had a backup helmet yeah. that had the radio system just in case the first two quarterbacks went down. All right, yeah. did you? Be honest. Were okay. you kind of ho- not that you didn't ever want to see someone get hurt, and that's no, not what you I'm suggesting. But like, get hurt, but yeah, I wanted like, to, I, they, right? they needed to go down. Right? I wanted to throw some passes. Okay. It's, oh man, it was in San Francisco one year. Um, Alex was hurt. Sean Hill was hurt. We brought in Chris Winky. Oh, here on we like go. A Wednesday. Chris was gray hair and everything was old, and, and Chris <laughs> barely could take a snap. I remember on that Wednesday, office coordinator looking at me like, Mike, dude. You're probably gonna play this week. Well, like, how pumped were you? I was like, let's just go, let's go, bro. <laughs> I been waiting for this. I was a Hosman finalist. I yeah. was just trying to yeah. pump, pump, toot my own horn. He got himself straight and whatever. But that week in practice, yeah, I called some plays. I ran my two minute drill. I was a little pumped up. So totally different. A couple weeks ago, we have an international game, right? It's yes. in Munich. And we have a shift here at NFL Network called Hot Standby. So I asked someone, I'm like, yo, I don't get it. Like, what's the difference between Hot Standby and Standby? And they're like, oh, Hot Standby, you actually are sitting on the set on the waiting set. for the feed to go down. So the damn show's at 4 a.m. So like you get in, I got in at 3 that morning. I had breakfast at 3.30. Like you get makeup and every, like I see the video, so I know everything's fine. At 3.57, they get into my ear and Cynthia. Cynthia Freeland yeah. was on set with me like, Yo, they can't hear us in Munich. You guys are going to start the show. We did 25 minutes. Good so, job. but it's like one of those moments, I'm not going to lie. At 4 a.m., you're kind of like, yo, I don't know if I want to play right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I, I would have probably been like, is this really happening? Yeah. yeah. Is this happening for But me? honestly, once once it goes on, then you're like, oh, actually, I'm glad. And then you, we did like the first, like I said, 25 minutes. And I said, I'm like, man, screw Munich. Like, let's yeah, just do the rest do of the thing here. here. You no, know, pro so, yams. Yeah, That's how you get down. No, at that point, I'm like, yo, I woke up at 2 a.m. You might as well let me just do the whole show. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Um, and, you know, you, you know, four cups of coffee that day. It was, it was not. I'm you still get not, it going. Your circadian yeah. rhythm all messed Yo, up. It man. is so messed up right now. <laughs> that and daylight savings and the whole thing. All right, big pad, small pad guy. So again, it was I was like in between because I played a big guy position, but yet I was cool though because I used to play quarterback yeah. too. So I wanted the small pads, but I did have a little baby neck roll. It was a baby one, man. So it didn't go out my pads. It was still inside my jersey, but you still saw it. But it didn't look like crazy. No. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm with you. You know, stylistically, <laughs> I'm going to bring this back to broadcasters. You know, back in the day, the suits had the shoulder pad deal in it. Bro. Yeah, man, you can't. I, that they don't look good anymore. I can see you in a shoulder pad. Uh, what are you talking? You know how much I work out on the trap sphere? Like I don't need shoulder pads. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I was with the shoulder pad <laughs> suit on. That was I actually my my like first suits like when I got into broadcast yeah. had the shoulder pads. In oh there. man, those I look so the- much more Jack now. I don't even need the damn pads. Are you kidding me? I don't want any of that stuff. Um, shoulder pads though, obviously are are really significant and, and sort of iconic, just like the helmets. It's a big differentiator in our sport compared to the other ones. But let's take a trip back to the 1920s. We're, we're all about like these flashbacks wow. here. Players actually first started wearing shoulder pads, um, but they were actually made out of felt, wool, and leather. Wool and leather? Yeah, but think about that, right? Like we had the helmets that were leather, so they were probably like, I'm thinking like cow. I don't even want to tell you what I'm so, thinking. But like so it's, it's not- funny. You know I played at Penn State. Yeah. You know yeah, yeah. Joe Paterno was my coach, right? You do know that, right? I've heard the that The greatest too. coach of all time. Um Joe used to always say, football got dangerous when you took the leather helmets off. Yeah. When we had less shoulder pads, guys 
trust me, you're not going to run into another human being knowing you're going to feel all of it's that. Great, you know what I'm it's saying? It's a great call. He was like, you want to take the helmet out of it? You want to take the head out of football? Put leather helmets on. Yeah. That yeah. was always his vote. No wonder you're such a big proponent for flag football. Yeah, so. Come on, yeah. <laughs> bring it all home, baby. Yes. Full circle here. So once again, we're, this is what we're talking about, like cloth and leather in the 1920s for pads. By the 1960s, we actually moved from the hardened leather to fiber shell to plastic. And the plastic shoulder pads were actually expanded in size so much in the 80s and 90s. Guys probably even had problems, right? Like walking yeah. through like doors. You kind of have to give it like Dude, a little angle. Dude, shoulder pads is way too damn big. Yeah. They were way too big. I just remember LeVon Kirkland, middle linebacker back in the day. I remember saying, dude, that's the National Football League. Yeah. Those are the linebackers that are coming to hit me. Oh, man, yeah, the shoulder pads were huge. How, how much do you think the slimmer pads actually help some of the more athletic plays that we see now? Oh, man, they, they're, they're everything. Yeah, I play with a guy, Michael Bennett. It's like Michael Bennett oh, didn't yeah. even have pads on. Yeah. Mike B would tell you, Mike, I wish I just didn't have pads. Just put me in a jersey and a helmet, and I'll be fine. But I, I just think what, what's happening now is the rules of the game – I'm making the game safer. We, we're we're starting to not eliminate, but we're eliminate not eliminate, but we're we're limiting the high impact collisions. And so smarter smaller pads help guys move better, move faster, sure. be a little bit more limber, have a little bit more flexibility. And to me, it's it's making the game safer because guys don't have to be so big and, and and the pads are smaller so they don't think mentally they could just run into guys full speed you have to think before you make tackles and blocks uh you're probably right about that and i'm, I'm hearing joe paterno giving you that advice telling you when the game got more <laughs> dangerous because of the pads but i think what you're describing to me makes a I'm whole lot of you, sense uh, another piece of equipment that's actually decreased in size and in some cases, you don't even see it. It's the thigh and the knee pads. That's always wild to me. You ever get when you were in elementary school that like your boy would come up to you and give you the dead leg? Oh, yeah. You know, like knee you in the side. <laughs> By the way, now I, now I actually pay someone basically to do that to every do that. week. Yeah. I go to the chiropractor and it's get that, that IT, IT deal. Band. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, this hurts so bad. It's crazy. But that's that's kind of a thing now. Um, they were actually originally the, the knee and the, the thigh pads, originally plastic, but they've transformed softer, more flexible material prior to 2013 players had the option of not wearing them uh, but then they became mandatory nevertheless the slimming of the pads has made the overall profile of the players a whole lot sleeker do you, <laughs> you here's how i'm gonna go with this okay like i remember like it's a it's a physical sport like alan iverson used to wear like butt and thigh pads all the time playing basketball because mm -hmm. you used to get the contact smack smack right on the you know it was just to draw fouls in the whole deal I think it's crazy not to have as much protection around your legs as, as possible. Like, is, am I crazy thinking that? Let me just let me think, just think about this, Yams. Um, you're running back, you're running the football, or whatever. Your ball carrier running the football, and you got a you got this thigh pad. Okay, I don't know, half inch, sure. quarter inch thick. You know what I'm saying? A guy that's coming to hit me, he's probably I don't know. Let's just say he's 6'3", 305 pounds. He's a defensive Bigger than tackle. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Probably two or three times. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm me? saying? <laughs> and he's running. He runs a sub 4'5". So when that 300 pounds hits me, it's actually more force than 300 pounds. Yeah. Right? Oftentimes, my leg is in the ground. I have to be able to take that and absorb that that hit. Them little, them little pads right there? Not enough. I mean... What are they really doing? Yeah. Not so sure. So you'd rather just let it roll? That's just me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Unless you're going to put the big pads there to actually do something, that's going to slow guys up. Okay. You know I was just I'm about saying? to ask, like, is it a speed issue too? And again, it, it probably isn't, but that's yeah. what it feels like as a player. You know what I'm saying? It feels like the bigger the pads is going to restrict me from moving and, you know. You know, I, this sounds crazy, but I, I'm thinking about like my wine club and the shipment of wine that I, you and I have to talk about this too, but <laughs> all the way off air. And they put these these like foam casings around mm -hmm. the bottles, right? Mm -hmm. They're so light, but I would imagine they're able to absorb a whole lot. Like I'm thinking, you know, not that they need packing material and they have people <laughs> way smarter than me that deal with equipment, but I would imagine that wouldn't slow you down as much. I, again, 
I don't think it slows you down as much. I think it's, you know, again, it's it's for your protection. And actually, when I'm in my pads, I actually used to feel faster. But again, in my head as a as a ball carrier, as a football player, and I'm looking, this little pad, it's tough for me to think that it's going to stop the impact of this 300-pound man hitting me in my legs. All right. So another thing that's sort of changed over time is jerseys. And you and I both know jerseys is how we identify dudes. Yeah. They are is extremely popular. You go to any NFL stadium and you just see a sea of jerseys, You know, people just rocking them for their favorite players. Um, back in the day, wool and cotton jerseys. Wool? Yo, man. Can you what's catch up a plate with of wool? wool, man? You might they as well do wool. like, what's the, what's the fabric with the potato sack deal? You know, like the... Oh, that really yeah, rough, that really rough woven yeah, yeah, yeah. type. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Man. That, you're going to go wool. You might as well just burlap. <laughs> is that what it is? Um, <laughs> now fans, no, it's it's polyester. It's mesh. They're a little bit more fitted, harder to grab on. I've heard some stories over the years, like you grease yourself up a little bit, Vaseline, whatever the case may be. <laughs> you like you were so fat, you don't really worry about that stuff. But <laughs> any any sort of tricks that you have come across in your time, guys, just trying to get away with things. Oh, tricks! Some now guys you're thinking, trying right, to get who away can with I stuff. not call yeah, out? Yeah, who, no. who can I not call out? I know. Um, in cold weather games, you know, guys putting the Vaseline and stuff all over their yeah, arms yeah. and and stuff like that. Uh, you, you you put the the hand warmers in in the toes and the feet of your cleats and, and stuff like that. Um, I know for me, I used Michael Vick when I was coming out of college, uh, was the guy. You know what I'm saying? I was a quarterback yeah. in Virginia. Yeah. He was from Virginia. I wanted my jersey when I played quarterback to look exactly like how Michael Vick's jersey was cut. But um, biologically, my arms wasn't as long as his, so it restricted me from throwing the football. So I would always get my jerseys really, really tight even no. when I played fullback. But they were so tight, I would have to cut them underneath the arms because no it would literally yeah. cut my armpit. I would have scars from the jersey cutting and digging into my Were you wearing skin. wool? <laughs> no, I wasn't, it wasn't wool. Uh, it was just so tight. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, man, that's kind of my, just things I did with my jersey. All right, so anyone who plays or played football knows uh-huh. when you're wearing gloves, they have changed dramatically. I've worked with enough wide receivers in my career and they'll tell you, they watch some catches like, yo man, stick them. That's that's all that is. We didn't have that back in my day. Stick them um, is illegal. Yeah, no more so, stick em. Well, yeah. no right. more stick them. Okay, we got gloves, Mike. Which basically, or here's where <laughs> I'm going to go with this. So Justin Jefferson, a couple weeks ago, you you told me on Total Access, greatest catch I've ever seen. Catch it, ever was, seen. it was it was really was. remarkable. Um, I don't know if he does he does he grab that. I, I, I think so. Okay. I look at the Odell catch as more of a glove thing because of the way the ball was coming down. Oh, you're a hater. Stop the ball. I'm no, not no. hating. I think Odell's one of the most dynamic receivers ever played this game. No. I just look at the way Justin Jefferson's catch was. His was more of the ball in the palm of his hand, the the defender helping him no. catch the football a little bit. That's why I think it was less gloves. Okay, so I, I throw this your way because players, like like I said, back in the day used to use like stick them, put some paste, a little aerosol, anything <laughs> to to get a little bit of like friction on mm-hmm. the gloves to make it easier. All that stuff, by the way, banned in 1981. But how about this? Jerry Rice is like, I'll take your ban and you can – Put it where you're not supposed to put things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What happened? Uh, so Jerry Rice used to say, like he he would use stick them. So I don't I don't know if anyone was actually checking the goats gloves, but what I do know is there is actually a team that actually checks every single game your uniforms. In fact, yes. I'm very well aware of this. Here at NFL Network, Steve Mariucci and I are locker mates. Yeah. Mooch. Every time I see him on a Monday, he will show me pictures that he takes of guys in uniforms. Uniform violation. He is so he is like a stickler for this time. He's like, to, it's ugly. They got to do it right. He gets really upset about I it. I used to know, I, I know in, in Seattle, I used to know who our guy was. It's the same guy because he lives in the area. And every game coming out, he, he knew, but he had to, it was part of his job. He had to remind me, Mike, got to change your cleats because yeah. your cleats have to have I think a certain percentage of the home colors or I don't know. It's a bunch of different rules. And I would always say, bro, you already know I'm a change, but I got to look fresh for the warm ups, yeah, man. I'll yeah. change. But if you come back out there with those cleats, he's sitting there looking at you. 
he gonna he gonna write you up and he'll find you. So there are actually sixty four NFL employees that monitor what? uniforms and equipment before department. each game. You gotta be up to code here. <laughs> League operations manual states. All players must tuck in their jerseys. They cannot wear bandanas. Stockings must be white from the top of the shoe to mid-calf and approved. And an approved, sorry, stockings must be white from the top of the shoe to mid-calf and an approved team color from mid-calf to the bottom of the pant leg, which must be pulled down below the knees. That's actually the below the knees thing. That's what gets Mooch like on another level. And we never pull the pants nope. down b- b- below the and knees. And he gets so mad at that. It's ridiculous. And the white never goes up halfway. A lot of times guys put black socks up there. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's wild. Players cannot wear headgear or any other equipment or apparel that in the opinion of the uniform inspector or the referee may confuse an opponent because its color is similar to a football. Only logos or brands from the league's official partners can be displayed. Players may wear other brands as long as they remove or cover the name on the logo. Hello. I remember when uh, Under Armour was first coming out. I was coming into the league at the time. And they went to the university, the founders went to the University of Maryland and uh, they were trying to get guys to, to be a part of the part of their, their their group. And they weren't league. They weren't approved yet. And I remember mm-hmm. Vernon Davis was on my team with the San Francisco 49ers. Every single game he had to cover the, the logo up. He had to tape the cleats up. He didn't want to tape the cleats. Yeah. He wanted to show the cleats off, but they weren't approved yet. Wow. Did you get any paper from those dudes? No, I ain't get no paper from them oh. dudes. I want some paper from them. Yeah. We can... I'll wear Under Armour all day right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No matter if it's league approved or not, I'm ready to get paid. Exactly. Uh, fines for equipment violations can actually add up. Um, for foreign substances on the body of your uniform, 5K for the first offense. The same goes for an unapproved visor tint and over $10,000 for writing personal messages or wearing unauthorized logos, branding, or intellectual property. It's a ton to keep track of. Any any fines, any like of your, your former teammates or friends that you can like think of that just said, screw it, I'll pay the fine every single week and it keeps going up? Oh, beast mode. Did he, he care? Oh, you know, beast mode wear gold cleats. He wear beast mode brand stuff. None of that stuff was approved. He said, uh, here's a check. When the year's over, whatever the fines were, just write the number right there. I'm going to pay. I mean, that's the way it is. Yeah. But again... His beast mode brand made money on the back end. It's a good point. It, it, it's offset in his favor in a big way. <laughs> exactly. I feel like the equipment manager has a lot of pressure on them. Oh, first of all, the equipment manager in every football building, all 32 buildings around this country, are the most popular people in the building. They help us get our cleats. They help us uh, connect with the brand reps, with the Nike reps, the Reebok. I mean, they do everything oftentimes. Oftentimes, team meetings, unofficial team player meetings are in the equipment manager's office. That's just where guys hang out. That's where guys have a coffee. That's where guys have their lunch. I mean, the equipment manager is the guy, man. I love it. EK, shout out to EK. Yeah. You mentioned neck rolls a little bit earlier yeah. in, in this edition. For you, was it just like straight intimidation factor? No, it wasn't. Um. I had a stinger issue. I used to always get stingers. And when I went to my chiropractor, um, he ended up telling me, like, your neck's supposed to have, like, a, a curve, like, um, a question mark. Yeah, yeah. My neck was an explanation point. Oh. And so instead of Is that the a- only reason why you're taller than me? <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, Mike. Stop it, Mike. Uh, I have the natural curve. Stop Yours is straight. You got it. it. So- Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> okay that was a good one that was a good one that was a real good one but um yeah so my neck uh the reason why i was getting a lot of stingers was because i was absorbing yeah. my neck was a little bit more straight and didn't have the spring well i used to have to wear this brace 20 minutes a day just to no correct kidding. the curve in my neck and actually um i advise a lot of fullbacks currently in the national football league a lot of guys call me hit me up inbox hey mike i'm getting stingers i'm getting this for my neck or whatever I show them the device I have, and a lot of them, a lot of them get it, and the stingers go away. So it's interesting. Recently, I've seen this happen. Actually, Taylor Rapp, um, I got to know a little bit. He plays for the Rams now. He went to Washington. I used to cover him, and I saw him post this on social media. And then I realized, like, this is becoming a thing. And it's not a neck roll of sorts. It's actually called the Q collar. It's a lot yes. smaller, but it applies light pressure to the neck, and the collar actually increases blood volume in the head, providing extra cushion for the brain during impacts. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like looking at some of the descriptions. 
something. Is that really safe? Well, the FDA actually approved this thing in 2021. A ton of players use it. Tony Pollard certainly comes to mind. Uh, Shaq Thompson, I mentioned Taylor Rapp already. In addition, four NFL teams, along with eight D1 teams, actually have mouth guards featuring sensors that gather data for analysis of the frequency and severity of a lot of the impacts, not only during the games, but also during practices. That's actually part of the NFL's $60 million commitment to try to help promote health and safety for a lot of the players. It, like, I know you're not surprised hearing about some of this That's ingenious. Yeah. I, was, I was a part of a group that was trying to develop a mouthpiece like that about five or six years ago. Um, j- j- just think about if a player knew exactly uh, the content of his saliva or whatever when he's healthy and he's fully hydrated and then going through practice and knowing exactly how much water you need to drink, how many electrolytes you need. I mean, what an advantage uh, for an athlete. So, yeah, kudos for the National Football League and to those college programs using the program. Anything else that you want to see equipment-wise? That might be helpful for you. Anything I want to see, uh, anything else I want to see equipment wise. I mean, because now it's like GPS monitors at practice, tracking, you know, sleep, all, all of that. Like I feel like heart rate, a lot of this stuff is already available. I don't know if you want to see anything taken to another level or not. No, it, it's tough. I mean, I think, you know, the people in our sport, they've thought of everything. Yeah. Um, I think now it's just about improving the technology that we yeah. already have and making the technology so that it's not a, all, it's not just a you know a, a, an all-encompassing thing meaning you and I are different uh yes it can have the same test on both of us but understanding that we're different people yeah. and maybe uh you know an answer for you may not always be the same answer for myself really fascinating to hear about a lot of the stuff with equipment really appreciate that guy that shot me a dm and yeah. <laughs> sparked this entire episode i dope. know uh, i promise because we keep getting some of these dms you can hit me up at mike underscore yam you can follow mike rob there at real mike rob because he's not going to answer your dms <laughs> i will i promise um but we're, we're going to continue i i'm telling you guys i get the screen i get the dms i screenshot it i send it to our entire yes, team m rob's on there i usually fire off the emoji if we don't get to it in our next mailbag edition we're going to do exactly what we just did which is take your question and make it a whole episode. Uh, Really appreciate you guys listening. Tell your friends about NFL Explained.